<laughs> okay, uh, welcome to uh, Volleyball Coaches of Canada Session 15. It's Coach Wildman here, and uh, we have uh, special guest Je Jeff Anderson from Queen's Volleyball Club, and super special guest uh, Kevin Hambly from uh, Stanford, uh, women's head coach, national champion uh, in 2000, I guess it was 2019-20 season. Uh, or the 2019 seasons. It's been so long because of uh, COVID, as you, as you said, Kevin. So uh, we're really excited to have you a part of this. You're uh, our second uh, U.S. kind of affiliate. We had uh, John Kessel on uh, uh, about a year ago, and uh, we're excited to pick your brain for the next hour. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you guys. Uh, following Kessel, that's big, big shoes to fill. I'm, I'm saying like expectations a little bit lower than John. He's a different thinker than I am, that's for sure. So, uh, Thanks, yeah, no problem. So I'll, I'll just start off, um, you know, uh, I, for, for everyone joining, feel free to ask questions on the, on, on the chat, uh, in the comment box. So we're going to try to, we'll, we'll hit the COVID stuff right, on, right at the start. So we're not, you know, obviously beating a dead horse here. Um, I know everyone's going to ask, how's your team training and stuff like that. So why don't, why don't we start off with that? Obviously, you guys had this championship season and then COVID. Uh, so tell us, uh, kind of tell us what, what's happened since uh, you guys raised the trophy to, to where you are right now. Yeah, so I have a pretty young group that was coming back. We were really excited to get in the gym and train. Um, very, very talented group, but young. Uh, we just barely got started. You know, we started third week of January. We we're working through up till March 12th. So that was our, March 12th was a day when a lot of things happened, at least in our country. And um, everything shut down. And within a week, we weren't able to train, obviously, we weren't able to do anything, but also my team left town and went home. And they remained home uh, all the way through until August, where we thought we were going to have a season. They were back. The day they arrived, everything shut down again, essentially, where we knew we weren't going to have a season. Uh, we weren't going to play, have a fall championship, at least. Uh, the things were going to be moved to the spring. And so we are able to train on outdoor courts. We put two outdoor courts on our tennis facility and train under the lights uh, and did that for about three weeks. Um, and the rules for that for us were only two people could touch a ball. So uh, I could, you could serve to me and I could pass, but no one could set that ball and certainly no one could hit that ball. Or I could pass the ball and someone could set to me and then I could hit that ball. But that's it. So we couldn't play volleyball. We just could do individual drills for those three weeks. Those are county regulations, those are NCAA or anything like that, but those are county rules. Anyway, so we had those three weeks. The team, my team, all left together, went to San Diego. They trained through there for the rest of the quarter. And now, uh, and then a couple of them, or seven of them came back and did two weeks of training with us, which we were able to do actually indoors. And then literally as they were here, things started to shut down again. They all went home. And we won't see my, I won't see my team again for, well, until January 4th when they're all, they're all moving in. And then we're hoping we can actually train indoors and be able to play some volleyball. But that's going to be all uh, dictated by how the COVID rates are going, especially the hospital beds, the coming hospital beds are being filled and all that. So I, we've been kind of, I haven't been to the office since March 12th. I've been working from home since then. So the whole, whole life's are kind of turned upside down like it is everywhere. And we're just trying to figure out how to get the most out of this time. Still. Bring on. Devin, Devin, you have an incredible coaching resume with Stanford and Illinois and then the national team and, and support of that. Uh, the one that you were really humble on and you sort of skipped over in other podcasts I listened on you was when Coach Yoshida liked what you were doing and brought you to the national team. What was it that attracted him to you? What, did he ever tell you or share that? Uh, no, that's a good question. I don't know. I, he, he, he watched me just train in the junior team and I think he liked the, I mean, he never was explicitly said like what he liked. I mean, he implied some things and he definitely gave me, I mean, it was just me and him for the two coaches. So he gave me a lot of leeway there as much as he, as much as Toshi would, uh, especially by the end of my time. But I, I think, um, yeah, I could, I don't know. I have to ask him. I can send him an email and ask him, but I, I wouldn't know. I just know that he liked the way I train athletes and that's about it. Sorry. I wish I had a better answer. For that, but I, he's not a man of a lot of words. Uh, so. Awesome. Kevin, you also love that modeling, you, and you talked about that when you came to Stanford. You had a bunch of freshmen that didn't weren't allowed to model for you. This year, after losing the six, you did, 
and still having some of those players back. Have you seen the modeling, even in our crazy scenario, still happening with your new freshmen coming into your team? Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And it was great to see the, the the younger the younger players that are now stepping into roles where they have to play. You know, kind of what they learned, even just through our run, like they got better that whole time from through last year. Um, but you know, the simple things like how we want to play out a system and the tempo we want to play with, and then the movement patterns and all that stuff are are, are you know, once that modeling is established, if you can keep your group together for a while and you can train and you can reinforce that. I feel like it just takes care of itself where the players look around like, okay, what do you like about this player? And you see the way they're moving, you see the way they're operating, you see the way they're saying, you see the way they're attacking, and they just start to model that kind of naturally without much being said. And so I've absolutely seen that. Uh, even in the short little windows we've had, things are moving in a really good direction, which it needs to for us because we're going to have to be super efficient with our time to try to get ready to play while other teams are able to train a lot more than we are. So I, I got a question for you, Kevin. So now, you know, you, you follow in, in Dunning's footsteps, um, you know, who, who was very successful there. And how does the recruiting side change for you now, now that you've had six leave? COVID is obviously a, 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 a puzzle piece in the grand scheme of things. Um, how does this change your recruiting game uh, to obviously keep that championship building team and uh, over the next, you know, four to five years? Yeah, I mean, I think fortunately for this this period right now, we're really only re we're recruiting actively one class, uh, the 22 class, and we were able to get a pretty good evaluation of that class before. So we're kind of relying on that. And also, I only had one scholarship, so we only have 12 scholarships that we can allocate to our whole team. So I had one scholarship for that class. I can't talk talk specifics about that class as far as um, like who we're recruiting and all that stuff. But you, you wouldn't know these players anyway up in Canada, so it'd be a waste of time. But our, so our 21 class was pretty much done already. The 21 class, which is a class coming in the fall of 21, uh, they they were already committed to the, to the process and were already in. So we were only looking at filling like three spots. Two of them were a walk-on one scholarship. So I think for us, we were very lucky. For that 22 class in our country, it is stress city for those guys. Like they are stressed out of their minds because – um, they didn't get a, they didn't get a lot of time to, for coaches to see them and to be evaluated. I mean, we're pretty fortunate. We were kind of locked in on a couple of athletes, and one of them, the one we really wanted, ended up wanting to do this and could do it academically. So it hasn't affected us much. I worry more about um, the 23 and 24 classes that are coming up. The sophomores, like, if we don't get good evaluation, we don't have great evaluations on those classes, and if we don't get that opportunity, I think um, it'll really delay the recruiting, and or kids will just commit without a lot of knowledge and for both coaches and the players and could lead to a lot of transfers in the future, which is something that none of us want to see. But I, I, I would say for us, it hasn't hurt us a great deal. And we're pretty fortunate. A lot of athletes will want to come to Stanford. The, the top athletes want to come. And, um, if they're high academic, and they're, especially if they're high academic and they're good volleyball players, they're great volleyball players. Um, this place recruits itself in a lot of ways. With that. Sure. So we're pretty fortunate that way at Stanford. Yeah, Kevin, I love that you said Stanford, it's that, that ratio of one of seven are athletes on campus and, and just that intellectual prowess they have and when you set out something, you get 40 questions rather than the two yeah. Illinois you talked about. Uh, is that still the case? With your they're they're still Stanford campus? kids, man. They're still curious. They're, they, and they, yeah, they absolutely have a ton of questions and I love it and, you know, like even even now we have our little Zoom calls and we talk about what's ever happening on with COVID and whatever is happening and, it, and like with administration and how we're trying to manage it and there's just I just I pause after every statement and I give them space and there's some million questions and it's great I love it I love it awesome. another lead into that question Jeff the differences between NCAA player using players you're using the DS and the libs yeah um, what you would say the we ones yeah uh, that term of endurance yeah absolutely how do you see that benefiting those players you mean the questions and all that? As far as that, is that you're asking? Like no, oh, so oh, the new, the different legislation, the different rules. Yeah, or, yeah that we have. Um, well, I think it benefits the team as a whole because more feel, players feel like they can have an impact, right? It obviously kind of helps the level. So the rules for us that are different is that we have, you know, and I played international volleyball and men's volleyball in our country is different than women's. They have the six subs and the one entry. Um, for us, we have unlimited entries and uh, 12 subs. 
uh, actually 15 subs. Uh, sorry, we have, we have 15 subs. So, which is a ridiculous amount of subs. It's incredible. But what, and like, the modeling is different for women's volleyball here. The, way, the reason the rules exist the way they do is because they want participation. They want more athletes participating. And so the byproduct of that is that you have, I think we're more specialized, but we can have some kids that can't play back row. We can have some big kids, some, like, like Adriana Fitzmaurice, plus is a great example. She could play some back row, but it was she wasn't great at it. But she's 6'6 six, six and blocks and can hit the ball hard. And I could put a player like Kate Formico, who is actually statistically our best passer, in the back row for her. And so you got these guys that were Kate would never have had a role for us. You know, she wasn't going to beat out our libero, Morgan Hens, but she could be on the floor and play in some big moments for us. And so there's opportunities to have more players on the floor. So I think for culturally for the team, everyone feels like they have an impact. You know, I had a player, one of my, my one of my only Canadian last year that I had, Sydney Wilson, different Toronto. She was a serving sub for us and played in huge moments for us but would absolutely have never played if we weren't allowed to kind of just um, make those subs and use those subs the way we can in our country. So I know a lot of people complain about our sub system. I think for us, if you, if you understand the reason why it exists, it's really about about um, trying to get as many kids uh, playing on the floor. It makes a lot of sense if that's the model you're looking at. If you're looking at developing national team players, it makes zero sense. But if you're looking at um, a great experience for a lot of great, for a lot of athletes and a lot of uh, great you, you know, young women, it works out fantastically for that. Awesome, yeah, and that sort of leads into that next piece of just your whole cultural full focus you have with the girls uh, is just the race to failure. And yeah. the whole Catherine Plummer piece of where she was your all-star incredible a attack on 219, where in 18 she was very limited to that cross court, and you said she worked on that line. What about her passing as well? Was she really working hard with that passing? Because that seemed to be one of her little areas of weakness. Yeah, passing and defense was the thing where she put the most focus on for sure because she knows, well, and we kept her out there the whole time. We wanted her to develop, and she was still good out of that court, but she got a lot of opportunities to pass and to play all, all the way around. But, I mean, she chose to play in Japan. This is a great example. I mean, she chose to play in Japan right now because she knows passing and defense is, you know, the main focus there. and. It's tough to get a kill in that in that league, you know, even as big and physical as she is, because she really wants to embrace that learning and to grow. And that's the reason she chose that. She could have stayed in Italy and I think been more comfortable, but she really made that choice because she really wants to be a, the best player she possibly can be and, you know, make all the mistakes necessary to kind of go down that path. Kevin, I got a question here from uh, Michelle Hunt. Um, she's a club coach up here and, uh, I think she's a dual citizen as well. But uh, anyways, Michelle Hunt has, uh, when recruiting an athlete, what is your number one thing you look for? Well, that's uh, that's that's hard because I don't think there's one thing. I think, like, I mean, if, if we went position by position, you know, like, I, I think I, like if I'll give an example. We could do outside. Sure. And I'd say arm. Like, we want to make sure, like, that's the first thing we make sure they have is an arm. But I think for us, like, I think the way I'll choose to answer this, and I'm sorry, Michelle, this doesn't answer it exactly, but I think there's a lot, the athlete, the athletic ability of the players that we are evaluating, it's pretty obvious. We're, I think we're fortunate that way, the kids that we want, as far as, like, they got big arms, they could jump high, they could move, they could do all those things. I think the question that I ask myself whether I want to recruit this kid or not, and, like, what's the, what's the thing that would, pull a kid out of our recruiting process is when I watch him, like, I just ask myself, do I want to coach him? Like, are they, like, are they good? Like, and would they be a good teammate? There's someone I'd want to play with if I was a player. And it's pretty simple that way. You know, like, are they a good teammate? Are they giving more than they're taking? You know, they, do they have energy? Uh, do they compete? You know, what are they like that way? Because um, to me, that's what separates the kids that we want. And we have really put an emphasis on getting really competitive kids. I just want kids that love to compete and want to compete and aren't afraid of that. Um, over the maybe the, the best athletes because I just found I mean we within scale we're not going to take some kid that can't obviously perform at the highest level but we want kids that, that absolutely want to compete um, because coming to Stanford there's high expectations and you better everyone's coming after us and you better want to take on that competitive piece and, and go for it so awesome uh, se uh, second question here from Lee Carter uh, he's the women's head coach at Brandon University. Um, midline passing. Do you still have that as part of uh, as part of your passing technique? 
we do not. We're playing everything outside of our body. Yeah, we've gone away from that. As serves have in, in, increased in the pace, just found that we have to move on and that the way the ball floats, we're, too many of our athletes would take it in the throat, to be honest, and we just had to figure out how to pass difference. So we've changed that a great deal. We pick a side. We want to take it on the side. That, you'll hear that a lot if you come to our gym. Pick a side, you know, open up the ball, and then create an angle. We're talking about that a lot. Okay, cool. Yeah, Kevin, does that lead into that Gabriel Wolf motor skill learning piece of that external cueing to let them free and get to that ball the fastest and best way they can? Is that why? Yeah, I, I think there's lots of ways that like that we could use some of that external focus stuff on that. You know, I mean, just making a target, like, to, you know, having a target out there. I mean, there's some construction great stuff you can do to learn as well as far as like you know like for us like if we're talking about creating an angle we won't just say like put your arms out like this we'll say hey pass the side of the ball the ball is flowing this way pass on the side of the ball that's an external cueing if we're struggling to figure out how to create that angle we might have them you know like create a constraint where they're passing to the pole like all the way to the left so if they're passing in area one let's pass to area four so they can really exaggerate that angle and kind of create some of that so um i think that's something we're playing around with all the time it's just how how can we how can we create constraints you know that, that help them understand the movement or understand um, how they need to pass and also how you know how what kind of external cueing can we use I, you know for a long time before I ever read anything by Gabriel Wolf um, well Toshi was great with external cueing we 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 were using this external cueing has always just worked better as I was kind of playing around with how to help these kids learn. Exaggerations and external cueing were two things that I've always held on to, and I really learned from Toshi. He was really, well, I don't know if he's ahead of his time, or if that's, they were studying that in Japan, because he's actually a motor learning professor in Japan. So maybe they were way ahead of us in Japan, because uh, I feel like it's been the last 15 years that we've really kind of, at least in our country, latched on to those kind of concepts, and it's been good for our athletes, I think. Awesome, yeah, Ken, so in your journey, I was going to go to my next question, and you're leading into it already. That external cueing piece, I mean, your journey, have you ever felt you found some better turning terminology to use to your athletes are responding quicker, like the side of the ball or the bottom of the ball? Have you found some gems that you could share? <laughs> well, I, I think I, I found things that work, you know, like as far as movement stuff, instead of like saying, um, you know, like take a step this direction, we've talked about pushing the floor away. Like that's one that you hear a lot. So like, so you're using that counter push, you know, instead of just reaching. Because when you say take a step, a lot of kids, they just reach with their leg. And that actually doesn't, isn't how you want to move. You know, you want to get your center of gravity moving in a direction. So uh, that's something that we use. You'll hear a lot in our gym, especially with the middles, you know. Um, but I would say, I think, as you study, have I studied more, um, that I, I found that not just sticking to one thing, like just trying to kind of play with the language all the time and see what actually fits with the athletes and understand the concepts of like what external cueing is and what constraints led modeling, like constraint modeling is, and then trying to use those things to, to um, that work. I mean, another example I'll give you is, you know, when players, instead of saying like, hit it high and deep and make sure you're contacting it high above the net and all that, I'll talk about hitting the bottom of the ball a lot. Because like, we or like say like reach high and hit high. Don't say that. Just say hit the bottom of the ball, and they you know they have to reach up and hit with their palm. And so the ball is hit high and flat and stuff like that. You're not talking about hand contact. You're not talking about anything. But like here's the bottom of the ball and hit that. Or um, if I'm if I want to serve flat, you know we'll put up a, a, a you know the block what we used to use for blocking a lot where we have the elastic and put our arms underneath the elastic. I don't know if that's a thing in your country. That's a thing in ours. You throw your hands underneath. Uh, we pull that up to you know about six inches below the the antenna and use that as the cue, like, hey, serve the ball underneath that and drive that. And we found that that works really well. We don't even say that much, just, hey, hit it underneath that tape. They end up hitting it flat. They end up with good contact. They end up driving it. And then we'll add, hey, hit it to the back three feet of the court. And all of a sudden they're hitting these driving floaters that are, you know, what you were looking for where in the past, sort of talk about the speed of their approach and, you know, get some rotation and all this stuff and talk about their, their bodies kind of lead them down that path more with some of that external cueing stuff. That makes sense. So, sure. like on your passing, do you use any terminology on the trajectory you want for your pass? Like, for example, for youngers, a rainbow pass versus a waterfall. Well, we'll talk about the top of the antenna for us. I think, you know, like, just like, hey, we want it to be above the height antenna. And if it's higher than that, great. But that's all we talk about. And then, and then talk about, like, you know, you get on the bottom and the side of the ball, 
you know, you can get that ball up in that area a little bit to clean that angle. So, um, but we, I am not, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I think I'm sorting out my strengths and as I've evolved as a coach, my, you know, your strengths are moving target, but coming up with flowery language and coming up with cool names for drills and like making things fun. I struggle with that. I really struggle <laughs> with that. I, I rely on, my, I, I ask my sister like, look, this, this piece right here, we need, this needs to be, have a fun name or something like, can you guys give me some help on this? Cause I, I just am descriptive and everything that I'm talking about. It's pretty lame actually. So the waterfall and the, all that stuff, that sounds great. I need to, I need to, I'll take that and use that from now on. That's way better than I've come up with. Okay. We got a question. We got a question from Craig, uh, Craig, um, uh, arm, arm is an interesting, interesting thing to say about recruiting a hitter. It sounds like that is a tougher area to develop slash change. Uh, at uh, when you go into university, uh, can you expand on some of the key arm motions for different positions that you look for as a coach? Yeah, well, I would say so. We'll start with outside and opposites to the pins because I, I think they're the most important. I mean, if we're looking at arm, like the first thing we will notice, we want to notice, we'll notice is just power. It's just do they have the power to score? You know, at, at some point in the match. And it, at a big point in the match, every one of our players is going to have to hit it somebody and hit it hard, and they're going to have to beat that defensive player. You know, I just think, you know, I think the defense is going to be lined up, and they're going to have to have enough power to put that ball at somebody. Hopefully not, but I just feel like every match is going to happen and have enough power. So, I mean, that's the first thing we're looking at is power. And usually the players that have power have a really, really good draw with their elbows back, you know, um, they're broad to their chest and they're open here. And then they have great rotation, and good core strength, and all that. Like we, we so I guess uh, was it Brent? Was that who asked that question? Like uh, Craig, Craig what the name? Sorry, Craig. Craig. Yeah. Craig. Sorry, sorry, Craig. When Craig asked that question, yeah, I guess it's like it's not just the arm, you know. It's also like how do they organize their bodies and how to use their bodies to attack, and um, do they do they generate enough power to do that? And typically, I like to watch on the on the pin. I like to see the outsides, their elbow a little bit lower than their shoulder, because then they're going to swing high and flat and hit hard. And the, the best outsides I've seen, they're a little bit lower than a lot of coaches talk about getting that elbow high, you know, and I think that's more of a middle swing that you want to see when they want to get down and on top of it. I want to see our kids back and kind of in this position here and hitting the ball high and flat with a ton of power. And so and that's what we're looking for in the middle. You know, I think it's more about is the arm fast and do they have range and, you know, can they can they get on it quick and move the ball around? Um, the power isn't quite as necessary. Even on the slide, I feel like you can kind of you can get away with it medium arm, me, me, mediocre arm, if you can get on it quick and hit it to space fast. So I think that answers it. Yeah, no, great, great answer. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin. Yeah, Kevin, you could even expand on that. I love when you use the terminology of when the blocks late swing away or when it's strong delay and hit high flat hands. I love that description you shared before. Yeah, you, you just want me to talk, expand on that a little bit? Just, yeah. yeah. So I think when we talk about like how attacking the block, and especially when you start to play with some tempo, you know, when you're playing with tempo, um, there's a lot of times we can beat, you know, you want to try to beat the block. We talk about a lot of hit in the scene. And we want to, I, I don't know, we, we talk about the, the players being aware of what they're seeing, and if the block's not fully formed, um, can, can we score? And so there's two times when the block's not fully formed. The first time is if you're fast, you can get, get on it. They're usually not over. They're trying to, they're trying to form their block. And we can beat that like by going off the hands, or maybe just jamming in space and before the, in the seam or whatever. I'm trying to trying to beat them that way. The other time, which I think we don't talk about enough, is it's not fully formed when the blocks on the way down. So the Packers are jumping higher, and so um, they have a little bit more time where they can hang, especially the, some of our athletes that can jump really well. That when their hands are coming back, that's a really good time to go high and flat because their hands are back and it's off the hands. And usually those can lead to 20 to 25 feet. When the block's fully formed and they're penetrating, a lot of those deflections, even when you hit it in the right spots, end up going pretty straight up in the air. And so, I don't know, we just try to make them aware of that as much as possible and then talk about targets, you know, the outside two fingers of the hand, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, I think that's something that a kid like Megan McClure, who is our six foot outside that doesn't even touch 10 foot or, you know, she, or three meters or whatever, she's not even, she's under three meters to use, I'm trying to stick in the Canadian terms in the metric system, so, but she's not even in that. She needs to play that way in order to score, and she's really adopted that in the game. So I, I think that covers what you're, you're talking about, Jeff, if that makes sense. 
Yes, that's right. Yeah, again, I just love the way you explained that you know, to be a patient, strong attacker rather than just trying to blast it harder. Yeah. Rock, for sure. Kevin, I want to change gears for a second because you, as every incredible coach, and you are one in my book, uh, taking the blame for that 2017 loss against Florida. And you said you didn't know them well enough. And what suggestions would you have? Because I also heard you say that takes a while to grow. But what suggestions would you have for coaches that, for ourselves in club, that have to do it quick? We only have a short window yeah. with certain athletes. Are there any key areas that we could focus on to build those connections strong and quick? Yeah, well, if I could touch on two things, and thanks for saying that, Jeff, but I am, yeah, I, there's a lot, I got a lot of work ahead of me to, to be as good as I think I should be, but I appreciate that. But um, I would say two things. So first off, I would, I would have been more aggressive with how often I met with the athletes to get to know them a little bit sooner. Like I would find ways to do that. Like I was once every two weeks and I'd let some athletes slide if they didn't want to. I would have spent more time um, talking to them, um, you know, why we're traveling, why we're hanging out in the gym. I would have just grabbed them more, like in hindsight. I would have tried to just kind of have those relationships. There's time, there's space there. And they don't want to hang out with me all the time. You know, you know I'm the guy that if we have free vans, my van's going to be the least full, right? I mean, it's like it's the kids that like don't want to be in the van. Like I probably have the trainer and the radio person and I have everyone but the athletes. They're going to go with the with the other assistants. But I would just try to force that. The, the thing that I like, uh, as I've thought about it, the thing that I would have changed um, and I would have just kind of dealt with the issues of it. I would have, I tolerated the, all these behaviors and I used that in my mind, you know, that I didn't know them well enough to change these behaviors. I, I wouldn't have tolerated the behaviors in a way. And I would have maybe had a little, like risk the relationships just a little bit more early instead of trying to settle into the relationships and then trying to change the behaviors. Hmm. I wish I would have set a standard a little bit earlier in hindsight with those behaviors. Because as coaches, we all get the behaviors we tolerate. Like I think whatever we tolerate, we're going to get that. They're all going to kind of, they're all going to push their limits up to that and that's what they're going to get. And I allowed them to go, beyond the limits I was comfortable with because I didn't know them. But I think I would have drawn that line sooner and uh, and just held them more accountable to that earlier. But that's the only thing I could say that I would change. And so I guess my suggestion is set the behaviors and then spend as much time as you can. Like make sure you, you um, set the expectations of what the behaviors are in your gym. And then I would work my ass off to get uh, to know those athletes as fast as possible so they understand why those behaviors don't ex um, shouldn't ex shouldn't happen, and then also how I can help them really grow and, and understand me and why those things are there. Uh, I, I I think I would I mean if I look if I could do it again and rewind I, that's what I would have changed. So I don't know if that helps. Yeah, Kevin. In that moment though, like we were in you were in the fifth set and it was a ten a fifteen ten loss. So it wasn't like you were blown out or anything. Where was or what could you have done at one of those times if you had to be the timeout touch call at uh, 9-11 or that kind of thing. What could have changed in your mind if you knew them better? Is there something you could have said or did? Yeah, no, that's, I think that's the point. In that moment, there was nothing I could do. It was too late. Like, mm -hmm. it was done. We were formed. It had to happen months before that. It had to happen. The behavior that were the reasons why we were not, like, why we were, I mean, we use the term fracturing a lot. Like, we, our team was apart. Like, we were there in that moment because of talent. We weren't there because we were a good team. And everyone in that group was said that. Uh, we needed to change those behaviors in August, in September. Like it, at that point, there's nothing. I mean, we tried everything we could do. And like, you know, and, and, but it was too late because those behaviors had become part of our culture. The ones that I thought were unacceptable, they were part of the culture. And we had to get to work changing it. You know, and that, that didn't, we couldn't change it until we got back in January. And we were all eager to do that. So, um, I just think that's the thing that coaches, I don't, there's no magic pill in that moment. It's about building it over time and setting this, those standards really, really early. You know, I coach club as well. You know, when I, I got my club, you know, if I had to do that again, I would set those standards from the beginning and hold them to that. Like you have to predict out what you want this to look like when you are in that national semi, you know, ready to compete. And so I didn't do a good enough job of that early. Thanks. So uh, kind of, in the same concept, your support staff, your assistant coaches, trainers, et cetera, et cetera, 
how often do you meet with them and how much of a role do they take? Uh, we've heard lots of different answers from various coaches. So uh, are, are they a huge role? Do they have their own sort of, are they in charge of defense or are they in charge of offense or how does it work with uh, your guys' support staff? Yeah, um, I would say, so our support staff is pretty robust. So I have a trainer, strength coach, technical coordinator, director of operations, and also my wife. So like that's even, like, so she, she's really in charge. Yeah. Um, I got a volunteer, I have, and I have two assistants. So that's a pretty good group. And I would say my management style for all of them is we set the expectations, we share a vision, we share like what our mission is, and then I get out of their way. I just get out of their way. I want, I, like, I really, I want them to feel like they have autonomy in those places. Now, that doesn't mean that we just do whatever they say. Like, so I'll give you an example. Um, Alicia, Alicia Glass Childress, who is a great setter. I use Glass because that she was a setter and, and an Olympian and a silver med, uh, bronze medalist. Uh, incredible setter, incredible mind. If she stays in coaching for a long time, I think she she will kick my ass in coaching. There's no doubt about that. She is amazing. And she, for her, I, she has her offense. And so like we, we meet and talk a lot and uh, we meet every day. So we meet every day for, for about a half hour and talk to in a normal world, in the non COVID world about what we're doing in practice, you know, what we want to work on, on the individual players, things that we notice in the systems and all that stuff. But then once we talk about it and we understand what, what we're, where we're going, I stay completely out of her way and however she wants to get there, she can go. And I'm a resource for her if she's struggling. Um, or if she wants to ask questions, but mostly I want them to have autonomy. I want them to make it theirs. I want them to protect it. I want them to, to, um, yeah, I, the best term that I can come up with is just make it their own. So, and and so they have buy-in from the athletes because if they're just doing what I'm asking them, yeah, then yeah, then then they're just trying to please me. I don't want them to please me. I want them to be the best they can be, and I want our team to be the best they can be. And so autonomy, the autonomy piece, both in our staff. In, in our athletes is um, for me is incredibly important that I can, you know, we, we, we're principle based. So we all understand the principles that are, are in all of this. Uh, we understand the systems, like the systems are the systems that I've, that I've created with our staff, but like those have been consistent with staff changing. We talk about that. We understand it. We understand the parameters and what we're trying to accomplish. And then I give them the space to go make it theirs. For me, that keeps them very motivated, makes them better. Um, when things are struggling, they take it personal and they get to work and they struggle. They, fo they focus on it and they figure out how to problem solve on their own, uh, you know, all that stuff. And then we all talk about what we're working on with our, in our little bubbles, you know, like in our little silos where all we get together every day and we talk about it and then we help each other out. And so that's kind of how I manage all that. And it's for me, I didn't always manage it that way. And the more longer I've gone and the more I manage it that way and really give them that autonomy, the way better our teams have been. And that includes the athletes. The more I can put on the athletes and get out of their way, the better they are. My whole goal in life is to do nothing. That's my goal, <laughs> is to just teach all the stuff and then just sit back and do nothing. And it's just going on its own. And uh, I'm striving hard to make that happen because that would be an amazing day when I can just sit back and let the team kind of roll and the staff roll. Fair, fair enough. I got a question here from uh, Roy. In regards to external cueing or motor learning, how much emphasis would be on block training to random training with correcting mechanics. Yeah, I, I would say we probably we definitely do use some block training to for them to get a feel, and then once they get a feel for things, then we go as random as possible. And we actually, I mean, uh, to go even further, try to create as much chaos as we possibly can in our gym. Like if you if you came to us, like I want chaos. I want them to. I want the team to create order out of chaos. To me, that's when teams are playing at their best, is when because the game's chaotic and other teams are trying to make it chaotic. So I would say we do do block training, and it's all about when, once they feel like they got an understanding, then we as quick as we can we're moving on to to random training. And then once it's random, uh, once we're in that, like then we're you know I think then we're trying to create a lot of external cueing, especially in that um, and chaos for them to kind of solve problems and. I think that the problem solving helps reinforce the skills and the systems uh, a great deal, if that makes sense. Makes not getting, we can talk about that for a long time, I guess. Kevin, just in that, that piece to extend on that, I know you say you use about 45 minutes of your two hours just on that serve to pass. In that individual piece, is that where you would put the block? 
and then when you go into that team and then you're six on six. Yeah, yeah, just to, for them to get a feel and reinforce the things. And even in that block, it's more, it's still as game like as we can make it. And it's a live, well, maybe start with a kid on the ground, but it's a, a full distance serve or on a box hitting flat serves. But as soon as we feel pretty good, we're, we're back to like one on one surpass and they're going to jump floater at them or jump top spin at them and working on, you know, real live serves. So we, it's not exactly game like because you're used to, because I do think the complications of having people next to passing is something that's different than just being an individual passer out there. But it's as game like as we can make it and get as many reps as we can. I mean, okay. Um, uh, uh, another blocking. Yeah, I, so, Oops, sorry. I don't know if that, that answers the question, but that's yeah. kind of how we approach it. Yeah. With your block, uh, this is a question from Jeff, um, club coach up here in Calgary. With your blockers, I've noticed you have blockers keep their arms down at the net. Can you outline the perks of this over leaving their arms up or you know their midpoint? Yeah, there was a study done in Italy um, a couple years ago. I can't. I, I, I lost it in my move. I, it was at Illinois that I was reading it actually. So I think it's still on a hard drive there somewhere. Um, probably lost forever, but I, I haven't, and I haven't gone back to look at it, but there was research on are our hands in this position to here to over the net, like from here to over the net faster than down low um, or just relax. And it turns out that when your hands are high, it's slower than when your hands are down to it's relaxed. And so like if you're down and stiff, like anytime you're stiff, you're not going to move as fast. So we want to be loose. So we want our arms just to dangle and it turns out like from dangling arms to just over the net, um, we're faster getting over and also more efficient with that move. So if we think about it, if I'm here and I'm blocking and I'm a quick hitter, we'll just use a middle versus middle kind of situation. They set a 51 or a ball in the middle of the court. I have to go from here to here to there to block. But a lot of times that's what we do, whether we teach that or not. Right. I think we try to, coaches have tried to teach straight move. But when you jump, it doesn't happen. You use your arms when you jump, whether you – I mean, it just happens. And so then you go from here, down here, and then over. From this position, when they're down, you can't see my arms, but they're just dangling. I just go straight to the, my hand, straight to the, to the point where I want to block. And it's just more efficient. And every one of my players freaks out when we talk about it. And then every one of my players is like, man, this is so much easier after they, after they spend some time doing it. And that's when you're blocking the middle of the court. The, the rest of the time, we're moving somewhere – and so, like, coming from here to, like, throwing our arms down, it just always seemed unathletic and stiff and kind of contrived. And just I want them to be loose and be athletic. And so when they're just arms are down and they go to make a move, it's, to me it's more about being loose and down and, like, how they naturally hang than it is, like, having their arms down. I've seen people, I've seen some people try to emulate it and say, hey, we're trying to block like you guys are, and the kids' arms are straight down and they're stiff. And I'm like, no, oh, that's, you're missing the point. Like, the point is to be loose because then you want to go straight to the ball. And so, um yeah, I don't know. It's all about, it was just a scientific research thing I saw. And then as we implemented that, man, it, it, I thought we, we got a lot better, especially blocking space in the middle of the court fast because um, we just were able to throw our arms to where we wanted to go. But I don't know if that makes sense. No, nope, makes sense, yeah. It's a lot easier to demonstrate. Yeah, it would be a lot easier to demonstrate. Not in this little box. I'm yeah. trying to fit in this little box. I'm too big for that. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> Evan, yeah, the, up here in Canada, we've got some incredible young coaches doing some master study and uh, using BERT technology. And I know that you use BERT, but now you're fortunate in Stanford to have that high level equipment. But I really love your global RP and that rate of perceived exertion. Uh, on the board scale, do you use the 6 to 20 scale or the 1 to 10? And if you could expand on that for other coaches that might not. Yeah, we we've used the, we've used both. I think we're at the, we're at the six to twenty right now scale. Um, you want me a global RP in general? What that means? Mm -hmm. that, yeah. So so basically, global RP. I uh, I wish I should know who developed that. I don't, but it's been used by everybody. But it's been proven to be the most accurate predictor for um, exertion of the athletes. How like so basically how hard was practice? It's been more than anything else, more than any wearable. It's been proven to kind of dictate that. And so what it is, basically, is it's a formula. You ask your players at the end of practice to rate how hard was practice on a scale. So we'll use the 6 to 20 scale. Maybe the 1 to 10 is pretty simple. So either one, but like 1 to 10. So let's, let's just use 1 to 10. And they say the practice is 9. That means they think the practice is really hard. Then you multiply that. You put it in this equation. You multiply it by time and some other factors. And then you get this 
number that it produces. And that number will tell you how hard the athletes perceive practice. And so we track that all the time. And I think one of the things that coaches on that, uh, well, here's how we use it. I'll start, I'll back up a second. Here's how we use it is we really, as you're training, if you want to, you know, there's two things you got to worry about, overtraining and undertraining. You want to kind of right find that sweet spot. Okay. And the scale that we're trying to do, we're trying, we look at that rate, the, R, the global RPE over a seven day period. So we look at the seven days and we get the average of those, or we get the total of those seven days. And then we divide that by the last 28 days before that. And that ratio we want to be somewhere, if we're on the upper trajectory of 1.2 to 1.4, we're comfortable with 1.4. Beyond that, what we, we, we're looking at 1.6, but we feel like 1.4 is a good number there. So that means that, that that week, that seven week was harder, average, the average of that was harder than the, the month by a ratio of 1.2. Um, that's the highest we want it to be. And if we're on the downward trajectory, which we never do, to be honest, we never go down. But if you were to go down and taper, you'd want it to be at 0.8. So just a little bit lighter. You don't want to drop down to like a 0.5 or 0.6 because then you're in danger of under training. So that's all this. There's a ton of research, acute versus chronic loading. If you type it into Google Scholar, you know, a million things will pop up on that and you can look at all that stuff and do that. Does that make sense, Justin? Is that what you're asking? Yo, absolutely, Kevin. And okay. you, you touched on one little point that I'd love you to explain to some other coaches as well is that you don't taper anymore especially no. on your workout conditions, you keep it strong throughout to keep those testosterone levels up. Yeah, I, we found when you, we taper, we put ourselves at risk of injury, that just even even with the taper, that um, yeah, the hormonal changes that happen to the body by working hard are important. And loading, you know, putting weight on their backs and doing loading, that's important too for all that stuff. So we've really kind of looked at the, yeah, the, the um, chemistry that's going on in the body like how do we manipulate that at some level and uh it's just keep working keep working keep working and you know the lowest we go is like a i think a 1.1 1 .1. we were at a 1.1 1 .1 going into the final national championship name like the whole time we were 1.2 but even that week we we got after that week to get ready for the for that match so, interesting yeah. if i can say one more thing about yeah, that, don't. Don't mind. You don't mind. Yep. i think one of the things that coaches are like and i was guilty of this is when you see global RP, you're like, oh, these kids are just whining. They complain about practice being so hard. I, you know, I said that to a sports psychologist guy one time. I was like, man, I want an objective measure so bad. So you mentioned Vert. We have a thing called Connexon, which is a great tool. Um, but I was like, I want this objective measure so bad because I want to know actually how hard practice is. And he just was like, he just stopped. He goes, Kevin, you are missing the point. He's like, all that noise. I'm like, because I said, I think I'd use the term like, there's all this noise, they're stressed out about their boyfriends, they're stressed out about, you know, they, or girlfriends, they're stressed out about school, all this stuff, and that's why they feel this way. He's like, you're missing the point. That's, that all is a factor in how hard practice is. You need to know all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah. immediately I was like, thank you, you're 100% right. You know, because I think as coaches, we're like, we write this practice, we don't think it's that hard. And they rate it hard, and you're like, what's wrong with these guys? And it, there's, there's something. There's a lot. There's maybe a lot going on with these guys that we need to be aware of, and that that really led us down the path of all this other monitoring stuff, and then making sure we check in to make sure that we are seeing how all, what what's going on with all that other noise. So, as far as stress levels and all that. So, sorry about that. that to take it down. No, that was so, awesome. Coaches yeah. that are talking about global RPE, they look at it. I think when you first get into it, I I've had a lot of coaches talk about like I want an objective measure. This is the best measure you're going to get. So just like lean into that and understand that. Well, and Kevin, like you said, it's that one piece of what you found in Q11, that direct correlation between how stressed the athletes are, increased the injuries, and the performance also went down, correct? Yeah, I mean, cortisol levels go up, right? You, when there's all this research on that you see the injuries go up. And so we have to take all that stuff into account. We're talking about the chemistry of the body. That's when stress is, stress is high. That's going to help lead to injuries, and so we got to make sure that we understand what's going on. Question here from Dale. Hi, coaches. I'd love to know uh, what Coach Kevin thinks of dual sport athletes, indoor and beach. Knowing knowing Jenna Gray was a world class track athlete, did she train all year as well uh, with both sports? Yeah. I, I think dual sport being a dual sport athlete is great. I mean, I was a dual sport athlete in high school. My best athletes are dual sport athletes, and if I go down the line. Of my team the last couple of years, I mean, tons of dual sport athletes, and a lot of them did play beach. Others played basketball. Others, you know, ran track. And I mean, 
I think I think it's great. I think um, I like our players to go play beach. I think it's great. I think playing the sport, both sports in college, as we have at our school, is really hard on the bodies because they're they just get no off season. So I am. We have to manage that at some level. I'm not not in favor of that, but I we, there's some inherent risk in playing 24 uh, playing in 20 hours a, a, a a week for your whole season. I think there's some some issues that can arise, and so um, I just we got to be careful with that. But I love those sport athletes. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, excellent, Kevin. Um, Kevin, I'm a huge culture person as well, and you alluded to uh, you had the girls in preseason go out for like quad dinner. Are you a part of those dinners, or are those just for the athletes to do? And how do you know then they actually put their cell phones away? <laughs> yeah, trust. You know, just trust there. So I'm sure there's been meals with with cell phones. It's a great question. <laughs> but no, I like I I think either if we can do quad dinners or dual dinner, I, I think two one on one is even better, where they can have time to get to know each other. Uh, I mean, I think that's really important and. Um, and then, you know, do the same thing with our staff and do the same thing with me. We try to do that as much as possible. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, I think I think I trust our athletes. And once you explain the why to our athletes, why we want to do this and, like, why the, being the phone being away, and no TVs and all those kind of things, I think uh, I think those are – that's, that's they, they, I, I trust that they're going to actually, because they understand the why, implement that the appropriate way. But I guess we got to trust before we can, you know, let them, let them just, uh, betray our trust uh, – but I assume trust from the union. For sure. And in your practices, Kevin, like when you have that trust, when you have those athletes being, you know, owning the autonomous pieces, um, would you say you saw that grow with that group from the 2017, 18, 19, where they were holding each other and yourself accountable, even in practices? Yeah, I, I think the accountability piece. So, like, that's what we're talking about right now. So, our group right now. So, I'll, I'll yes, I would say yes. And uh, but I'll give an example of now is our team. I spent a lot of time in, like, what do we do at this time where we can't train? Well, let's work on our culture. Let's work on our individual relationships and all that. And they are incredibly tight. But the thing that we're talking about now is like, you guys are really tight, but as we got into the gym, kids weren't going the way as hard as we want to and things like that. No one's holding them accountable. No one's, no one's holding them to that. And so now we need to leverage those relationships. You know, like, I, I, get, I mean, my wife and I, we spend a lot of time together. We have a great relationship. I feel like we have a great relationship. I, I'm not going to ask her and bring her in, but I feel that way. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> what that allows us to do is talk talk about issues, to fight, knowing that we're not going to run away from each other and things are going to be okay at the end. And so we're talking a lot about with our team. Okay, we have great relationships. Now let's leverage those to hold each to be able to hold each other accountable. And the term that we've used is carefrication. This comment that I came across a couple of years ago. Um, like, hey, we, we need to confront this because I care. I care about you and I care about the team. And so that come that, that idea of carefication is really resonating with our group because, like you said, like calling them out or holding each other accountable. Like when I say hold each other accountable, what they think is calling each other out. And all of our athletes are very uncomfortable with that idea of calling each other out, mostly because they don't want to be perceived, excuse my language, this language, as a bitch. Like that's what they say all the time, but I don't want to be a bitch. It's like we got to get over this. So, like, I, and I was frustrated with that in this. The idea of carefrication ended up really resonating with them. When you uh, this question is from Dustin, and it kind of goes uh, on the topic that we're on. When you are selecting a team captain or assistant captains, uh, what things do you consider to find the best fit for the team, program, and culture? So I don't choose captains. We okay. have a floor captain. That's always our setter okay. because that's just what we've done. Um, they talk to the ref, and they're usually someone you want talking to the ref. But I don't do captains. Instead, um, I pay attention to like the group and who the group is following. Um, you know, you give them autonomy and you create, you ask questions and you create these things and you have them problem solve. You start to see who the people are following and who they listen to, and uh, and then I talk to those guys that people are following and develop them as leaders. So we don't do a vote. We don't do a captain. We don't do anything formal. I just found that that's worked out better for me. I've always found captain title like sometimes they try to be something instead of be them be themselves and they try to be a leader instead of just be themselves and if they're themselves and they're being followed then they're the leader and a lot of coaches i, I think uh, myself included early would appoint captain the people i thought my favorite kid or 
the kid I wanted everyone to emulate, but didn't mean that the team followed that kid. And so I make him a captain, and all of a sudden they're not being followed. It's a waste of energy and time, and also really frustrating for the kid that's the captain. Like, why aren't they following him? I'm the captain. All that stuff was, was counterproductive. And so I've just found that paying attention and watching how the team interacts and who they follow, and then recon- like recognizing that, and then helping those people develop has served me better as a coach. Now, what about re- oh, sorry, Jeff? Uh, what about recruiting? I mean, if you bring in a, a prospect, uh, do you let your team kind of be judge and jury, if you will, on how they interact with uh, the current team? Everyone's involved. In who's going to be in, like our, our assistant coaches, our strength coach? Like they meet with everybody, and I listen to everybody to see if there's any red flags. And I mean, if I'm being honest, when we're recruiting, we have a kid on campus. I want to spend a ton of, I want them to spend a ton of time with us, and to a point where they are exhausted and that we get to see, this is what I would say, so I'm going to say we see their ass. We want to see their worst. We want to see the worst of them. And then and then we know what their worst is and we know if we want to take that on. I would say the same for my assistant coaches, anyone I'm hiring. I just want to, I want them to, I want to see them at their worst or do the best we can to see them at their worst so that we know what's in and then we all want to sign off on them. And I get a lot of input from everybody, um, everyone that's involved in our program because we, we will all need to want to have those people around us and we're going to spend so much time together. We better all get along. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, there's two extensions that came off of what you're just saying there, Kevin. Number one, do you actually have any drills that push them to that level of exhaustion or point of frustration, and then you see how they deal with it? Or you mean in recruiting? Yeah. Well, or just in, yeah, yeah. In recruiting in your gym. No, in recruiting. So in recruiting, we can't do anything volleyball-wise on a recruiting visits, so it's hard. So it's more of um, just emotion wearing them down um but in, in the gym yeah i mean i think every day in practice it, like on tuesdays wednesdays is our hard days we're trying to push our team to that you know so but we don't we don't get to do that in the recruiting process unfortunately but we get to watch these tournaments where they play three days in a row and they're, they're playing you know 14 matches in three days and they're exhausted and you kind of get to see their their worst come out then and sure. their best for sure I love it when you said that, you know, not appointing a captain. Have you even seen times where most people will pick the best player or the strongest player and they actually aren't the ones the girls are leading? Is that why you sort of went away from that? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, and this is no offense to Plummer. Like Plummer is a great player. She did a lot by example. But our, a lot of people would have voted her captain, I think, because she was the best player. But our leaders, well, she was one of the leaders, but our the most vocal leader for us was Jenna Gray. And the, the task master and task leader for us was Morgan Hicks. And so, like, yeah, I mean, she wasn't going to let anyone, so, including me. Like, she she ran every, made sure everyone was going hard. So, like, those guys took care of, you know, those guys were our leaders, no doubt. And so, um, it's in that stuff, where, where certainly Plummer spoke up at times, but she was much more about lead by example. Uh, but she would have been probably voted by captain, which would have been unfair to her, because I think she would have been frustrated. A question here from Ron Thompson: uh, What is it that you th- uh, think? That, uh, what is it that you think makes you successful as a coach? What are your greatest strengths, technical, tactical, or both? Good question, Ron. <laughs> Tough one. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, what do I think makes me? Um, I think. I think actually, I think my my best strength is I know who I am, and. I know, I know um, that I don't know that much and I need everyone to help me. Like I really, like I like I figured out a way to help, like get, get everyone involved and, and for, for them to give them autonomy. And I figured out a way that works for me to be the head coach and kind of run all that stuff. Um, I, I think, I don't know, tactically and technically, I, I, a lot of people would say that blocking is our, like my, probably my biggest strength. And that's probably true, I guess. I think we've always had really strong blocking teams. And then, like the defense behind it, and organization of that, we've been very defensive minded um, in our time. And even with the national team, that was one of the things that I really focused on. And we probably were the best blocking team in the world at that point. So I think, yeah, probably blocking would be the thing. But I, I would say, knowing that I don't know anything and I need a lot of help and that I am constantly striving to get better. And like, even though I think blocking is our strength, I'm still looking at ways to be better at that. Um, I think the curio- like being curious and always. Um, never settling for where we are and constantly pushing everyone and stuff to just keep growing um, is probably probably my greatest strength, actually. Now that I've talked about it and thought about it a little bit. Okay, now uh, 
I know prior to us going live, we talked about, you know, that you're uh, a friend of Ben Josephson from Trinity Western uh, Men's Program, um, and you guys pick each other's brains. Uh, Dale has a question here. Who uh, are, are your mentors or your go-to people for advice and support, other than your wife? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, my Ben is definitely one of the people that I love his brain. I love the way he thinks about the game. He's become one of the people that I really bounce stuff off of, and we've talked about stuff. So I love talking to him. Um, Hugh McCutcheon is, uh, and I was in his wedding, and he's one of my best friends. So him and I talk quite a bit about stuff. Um, my mentor, I'd say Toshi Yoshida, Carl McGowan, BYU coach for a long time, um, incredible coach. Those guys were definitely the that got me down the path of, of understanding what this, what the coaching is. Um, some other people that I talked to, I got a guy named Arian Schimmel. He's a Dutch professional coach. He's a good friend of mine and a guy named Sheldon Collier, who is um, also an incredible coach at the Division II level because he chose to be, he was at Georgia Tech. He put Georgia Tech on the map and did a great job there. He was also a national team assistant. Those guys are the guys that I, they all think about the game different than I do and when they watch my team, they have different perceptions of what's going on, and they think I'm an idiot most of the time. So I like surrounding myself with those guys because they like to say, what are you doing here? What's going on with your team here? And just I love those conversations because, you know, you get your own little bubble and you don't get a chance to really, um, I don't know, you, you, you're, you're, st- you're limited by your own perceptions because you're, you see what you want to see a lot of times, and I need people to see uh, my blind spots, and so those guys help a great deal. Okay, uh, actually, my, my mentor just jumped on here with a question. Doug Reimer from University of British Columbia, uh, women's head coach. Um, thought It's a two-part question. Thought, thoughts on deve- developmental issues. Are you concerned with early spe- specialization in our sport in North America? That's, the par- that's part one. So you go ahead. Yes, 100%. If I, if I could, there's, two, there's a few things that I would do if I could. I would force at the junior level. My daughter's a 1300 junior player right now, and you know she's they're specialized. Their team's very specialized. I would love from 14 and under if they had to play a 6-0, meaning no setter, and they had to have you had eight players total, on, most most on a team, and they had to all play the skills. Like let them make them play the game, make them figure out how to play volleyball. I would absolutely love that. And then I would like I would also love to change where um, the height of the net for the young kids. Where we kept it low, I think we keep it low till 14 or till 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 13. I'd like there to be a, a range in between, so those kids could play and block. You know, and now they're out there. These little 13 to 14 year olds are playing on a, a women's net, and their hands are like this, and they never get the feeling of like actually getting up because there's so many middles that come up that are just reaching high, or so many blocks that are reaching high. I'd love to figure out a way to scale the height of the way we play to the the height of these players as far as like physically what they can handle. And so I think those and not letting them actually specialize would be huge. Give them a little barrel at that age and let all that stuff kind of happen as they get into 15, 16, 17. I think it's a big problem in our, in our country, actually. Farrah? Oh, go ahead, question. Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I've got a question, and I'm like your opinion on it, too. It frustrates the heck out of me at that 12, 13, 14, well, not so much 14, 11, 12, 13 level. They teach the kids to underhand serve. Yeah. That is not a skill we do. Would it not be better to shorten the service line, let them serve overhand, and learn the skill proper? Oh, boy. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> we lost them. We lost them. Hold on one sec. You was done. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. I put them over the edge. Hang on. Lost him. <laughs> Here's some good questions here, so I just want to pick his mind for maybe 10 more minutes. But uh, let's just hang tight here, everyone, and see if he just rejoins, seeing that we lost him. I just messaged him. Um, hang tight here. Great questions, uh, Jeff. we got to love technology. Yeah, no, I mean, we were doing so good. So let's just, uh, yeah, we'll just hang tight here and see uh, if he can just rejoin. Um, Hello? 
Oh, there we go. There you go. There you <laughs> there, it's done again. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I had it, I, my battery died. My battery died. I had no idea of dying. Sorry about that. I thought it was just too much of a question for you. But no. Yeah. I'm like, I don't, want to, I don't want to answer this question. Yeah, no, sorry about that. So, Jeff, go, go again. Sorry on that question. Yeah, finish your question. Yeah. yeah, so, Kevin, I was just saying, I would much prefer seeing kids do the skill properly, learn the overhand, but serve from the attack line and then make yeah. adjusting service lines as they do instead of the winning get the kids doing the skill proper what do you think i i agree 100 percent. that's the idea of like lowering the net and like we play the lighter ball all that whatever we can do to have the kids at younger like 11 12 13 playing the same way that the top level players are playing it as far as physically because there's too many limitations there i mean their, their hands are barely above the net that's ridiculous to me. let's lower the net even lower for the 11s and let them Figure, feel what it gets, feels like to get over the net and block, and then let them play that level, and they will enjoy it so much more. We would get more athletes in our sport if that were the case. Make the course smaller, you know, for them, so that they can they have more court cover. Make it this. I guess the best way I can put it is make like make everything to scale for the younger kids, so that they could actually play in the same way that these kids are playing. They do it in basketball, you know. They they play on young kids play on lower baskets, so they not that they can dunk, but so they can actually learn how to shoot. So. Yeah, in volleyball, Canada has brought in smash ball, so we play that yeah. almost like a badminton net with a badminton court and smaller. But you know, some of those skills don't. You know, again, it's that focus on winning rather than developing. Right, right. Yeah, that's the other part of it. We should all be about development. You know, at, at that age. Yeah. The second question that Doug Reimer had was: uh, any views on substitution numbers international? or the more uh, liberal U.S. rules at club and post-secondary? Yeah, I think there's something in between, right? Like the six, uh, I think that that would make a lot of sense internationally. We can get more players and take advantage of the incredible rosters that these teams have. Um, it seems to me that something like around eight with multiple entries could help the level of the game, especially from because with the men's game especially. It seems like there's, the serving is so aggressive that it could be nice to get a passer out there occasionally. We could kind of pull in and out another passer out there occasionally. But, you know, I haven't been in the international game in a long time. Like, that was one of the, like, as I watched the men's international, you know, that's an impression that I have. But I would probably look at, like, 8 to 10 with multiple entries or something like that. But um, it's not something I've really focused on. So. Okay. Let's see what else we got here. Sorry, Doug. I wish I had better answers. For <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, Kevin, the one piece I love you say, and I love you to say, because as coaches, we always deal with the frustrated athlete slash parent about playing time. And I love you said it once was, don't blame anyone else but yourself for that. Yeah, Can yeah. you expand on how you, again, you know, talk to that athlete about those playing time scenarios? Well, I think when you're talking about playing time, the first thing you have to, well, the players have to trust that you're sound in your decision making. So once you develop that trust with the players, the thing that I'll tell all of them, like I'm going to play the best player, and you will determine if you're on the floor or not, not me. And that's it. Like you're going to determine that. And so if if you play at a high enough level, if you pass a high enough level, if you're doing it, we'll get you on the floor. But it's going to be up to you to determine that. And yeah, so I mean, I think it's pretty simple from there. And I think. Um, you know, when parents call me and get involved, well, first, I usually tell them I'm going to hang up on them. I tell them that before. If you call me about playing and I'm, your daughter knows, ask her. Just ask her. She knows why she's not playing. Uh, I think that's the piece that, you know, if, they, if they're not playing, what can I do to play? And also, um, here's the reasons why you're not playing. Just saying, I just make it, this is my choice and leaving out there. Like, we have to tell them the why, the why is important. So I think if, when I manage my team the right way, I'm telling all of them, here's why you're playing or here's the role you're in. Um, and I need you to embrace that for us to be successful. If the parents call and it's like, hey, look, your kid knows why. She knows everything. I've explained all this to her. Ask her. She just, the reason she hasn't told you is because she doesn't want to, which in most cases she's scared to because mm -hmm. the parents are going to you know, get upset at them, which is kind of ridiculous. So, so this, that, this yeah, actually that, happens. Yeah. This happens at the yeah. highest level. You have parents still call you about playing time. Well, it's happened. It's happened three times. Oh, okay. <laughs> Still, three, three too many. <laughs> it's because, crazy. Because I tell them I'll hang up on them, and it's happened once, and they hung up on them. I said, hey, I told you I'd hang up on them. Second time, I just hung up on them. And the third time, I engaged for a minute, and then they, they went that direction. I said, hey, ask your daughter. I just hung up on them. So, Interesting. Um, now, if, it, if they don't want to talk to me about that, that seems like I, don't, I want the parents totally out of it. 
if they weren't talking about something that their daughter struggling with emotionally or mentally, I'm in. Yeah, for sure. sure. Those conversations have taken place. But when it comes to playing time, those, it's been lined out very, very as clear as I can communicate to our athletes who is playing, why they're playing, and what it takes to play. And so they kind of, our kids all know. Yep. And usually the kids are embarrassed. They're embarrassed. No, fair. No. Yeah. Excellent. And I guess we started on that COVID focus, Kevin, and then we go back. When you go back and you get to touch the court more, because like you said, you've been restricted as well, do you feel you're going to be able to start, you know, at that, let's say, 8-9 on, on the little RPE, you know, or hmm. what do you think? Are you going to have yeah. To we're going to have to. That's stuff we're actually talking about on Monday. Some of the conversations we're about to, like we've been looking at stuff and seeing because, our players are going to be all over the place as far as what they're able to do based on where they're living right now. So some of my players are playing three, four nights a week, you know, and lifting and all that because they can. Some of my California kids aren't allowed to do much because the stuff's shut down. They can't get in the weight room. They can't go practice. And so we're uh, – some players, yes, we could be at that rate. Some players, no. And so we're trying to we're trying to figure out how do we integrate them and how much time do we need. We may end up um, canceling matches – early because we, we're not going to be physically ready to take on the load that's required and I, I think that's more likely than, than not we're trying to play a 22 match schedule if we by, by the time we get to playing if we don't lose four of those matches at the very least and give ourselves two more weeks to train because we play two matches a week uh, I'll be shot I'll be shot so one last question here. Obviously, you know we started with COVID. We'll finish with COVID. I told I told you before this. Yeah, I said we weren't going to talk about this, but yeah, we're talking about it. Um, obviously, us coaches are. You know, we have a lot a lot of downtime. Is there any books that you suggest or or resources that you know that we can uh, dive into during this sort of holiday season that uh, that we're maybe stuck indoors? Yeah. I, um... Attention and Motor Skill Development is an incredible book. I don't know if you guys have read that. I've gone back and read a little bit of that by Gabrielle Wolf. Um, it's an incredible book. Talk about external queuing. I think I got that title wrong, but it's something like that. Okay. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm terrible with remembering names and that stuff. Um, that book's been great. Um, man, our team's reading Mindset. And, and, and right now, I don't know if that's by – it's, a, it's a, the, word, the term growth mindset or that concept like really blew up. Um, I am shocked how many people haven't read that book. Like I asked my team if they've read that book and even our staff, a bunch of people have it. So if I uh, just going to throw that one out there, I think that's a must read for everybody. Um, but honestly, at this point, books I'm reading are, I've read a lot of history books and stuff like that. I'm kind of, I love the history. I'm, I'm reading an amazing book about called 1491. It's about the native Americans all from all through, through Canada, mm-hmm. all the way down to through South America. And, um, uh, kind of, kind of before Columbus got here, you know, and it's it's amazing. That book's amazing. So anyway, that uh, but those two books I would say for coaching aspect are great books. I'm going to uh, sorry. I'm going to have one last question here, just because Rick Scott from Dalhousie uh, University just jumped online. Uh, so sorry, we're we're jumping all over the place here, but uh, I won't keep yeah. you long, Kevin. Uh, what what are your thoughts on players learning different ways to perform skills? Uh, yeah, I, does he mean that they look different in their technique, or is that does he mean uh, like? Uh, he technique? has an example here. Example is pivot setting on one foot versus jump jumping off two feet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, I think I I think th- I've had athletes that ha- are doing things. Here's how I'll answer that. I've had athletes that are doing things differently than I would have taught. Like I would have taught it, but it's super efficient and it's better and um, Ben actually it was the first time I heard this I think it's a really uh, I don't know a, a great observation by him that athletes innovate you know coaches don't innovate athletes innovate and maybe I'm giving something up for Ben if he's listening I'm sorry but like, <laughs> I, that, that term like I agree and so a lot of times if an athlete does something different kind of watch it and see how it's going and then um, see if it's if they're more efficient than I could have taught so I but I, I'm open. I'm, I guess I'm open to them in every aspect, making the skill theirs. Like I want the skill to be them to feel like the skill is theirs. That's why I like, you know, hey, let's teach these principles, let's teach this way. But you have to be on your own path to mastery. 
And if you can come up with a better way to do it, let's look at that. If, if we can find some inefficiencies in it, we'll try to clean it up. And then I had a I had a setter when I was coaching in course a men's team in, in UNLV when I started a boys club team. My setter went off his left leg all the time and it drove me crazy. But he, he could do some things off that left leg that I've never seen another person do. Like the way he played balls at the net could do things off his left leg, the way he can organize his body, and I kind of just left it alone. I would never taught that, and I would never te teach it. But for him, we tried other stuff. He was 100% better off his left leg. So I just kind of let him go um, because it worked for him. And I think not everyone's the same, and different things work for different people. And so I think we got to allow them that kind of space to explore their own mastery. I guess that's my answer. Sure. Awesome. Kevin, thank you so much for giving us an hour here. I can talk to you for, for much longer. But I appreciate, I appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate you guys asking me to be on. It's fun. It's, it's fun to talk about this stuff. And um, yeah, I hope you guys get through the COVID stuff here fast. I hope we all do. And we can actually be with our teams because it's a hard time right now. And I'll be with our team. I know we all miss it. Yeah, Kevin, it's been uh, it's been it's been an amazing interview from all the coaches up here in Canada. You know, we thank you for your time. Obviously, we wish you the best uh, moving forward with uh, whatever season you have, whenever that comes. Um, but uh, no, I have a merry Christmas and a, and a safe holiday, and, uh, and we'll be cheering you on from uh, the north of the 49th parallel. Uh, I appreciate it, guys. Thanks. Have a great Christmas. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Take care. Okay. See you guys. Bye bye.